I've got kids, and that means it's always about them. But I need support too. That's where Ollie comes in with their delightful, hardworking gummies. My partner and I can actually get a good night's sleep, so we'll both stand a chance of managing our stress responses. Even when the kids are doing parkour in the living room, discover Ollie vitamins and supplements. These statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming back. Laszlo Montgomery here once again for the sixth time talking about eunuchs and Chinese history. This is the China History Podcast, one of the longest running podcasts out there when it comes to Chinese history. This will be the final episode in the series, and from the quantity of notes I have in front of me, I'm guessing this one is not going to be a long one. Let's just tie up loose ends and take a look at what happened after the Empress Dowager Cixi died, mysteriously at that. A whole bunch of theories about the particulars surrounding her death and that of her nephew, the Guangxu Emperor, both dying within 24 hours of each other. <laughs> what are the odds of that happening? Anyway, with him out of the way, that cleared the way for the two-year-old Emperor Puyi to ascend the throne. But not for long, of course. His reign as the Shentong Emperor from February 1908 to February 1912 got to witness not only the end of the Qing Dynasty, but the whole institution of the emperorship going back to 221 BCE and Qin Shi Huang. The fall of the dynasty had quite a profound impact on the few thousand eunuchs who called the Forbidden City their home. Although the Qing dynasty had been dying in slow motion for the better part of the 19th century, when the end finally came, on Double Ten Day, 1911, it all seemed so sudden, even to those who had been plotting to bring down the dynasty for decades. The Articles of Favorable Treatment, negotiated by the 43-year-old Empress Dowager Long Yu on behalf of herself, the child emperor, and all her family and staff, didn't get nailed down till Abraham Lincoln's 103rd birthday on February 12, 1912. So after the fall of the dynasty, there followed a nail-biting few months for the Manchu Isenguro imperial family, and as I said, for all the eunuchs too. Li Lianying, who we looked at last time, he didn't live to witness this and died seven months before the Wuchang Uprising. There were plenty of rascals amongst the eunuchs, but as I've tried to emphasize, the overwhelming majority of palace eunuchs, going back to the earliest days, were just a bunch of low-paid working stiffs and did not interact with the emperor any more than the grounds crew at Allianz Stadium hangs out with Ronaldo. The top 1% of eunuchs, well-positioned in the inner palace, who had influence to sell and access to purchase orders or stolen objects that they could sell on the black market. For these eunuchs, during the period of their service, well, they had salted away enough money and had invested in enough pawn shops and tea houses around town where they survived just fine in their early retirement. Some eunuchs went back to their ancestral villages and were welcomed back into the families they had left behind. Some had married prior to their castration and went back to these wives. Some had married afterwards, and though they couldn't procreate any longer, that didn't mean they couldn't live together in conjugal bliss. What many ended up doing, if they could afford it, was to pool their resources to create these eunuch associations where they all sort of lived together, usually in a Buddhist temple, and that's where they lived out their days. They all had each other for safety and comfort, and this became their retirement home for the rest of their days. Those older eunuchs who had early on made payments to reserve a space in these temples, this was their end game. Some who had no place to go but managed to salt away a modest nest egg were able to pay their way into one of these places when they left the palace. They were welcome too. But for most eunuchs, especially those young ones who had not worked long enough to save for retirement, or who were still in debt to any number of Daozi Jiangs for doing his handiwork, they had a grave concern. There were some who knew 
They could never survive outside the palace walls. They had no money. Their family had long ago rejected them. There were stories of how the most desperate and forlorn just killed themselves, even drowned themselves by jumping into the moat that surrounded the Forbidden City. And just like that, they had to go out into the streets and hutongs of Beijing and fend for themselves. As many as a thousand to sixteen hundred of them left first. Some of their own volition, some were just booted out. And the rest had to wait and see what kind of deal Empress Dowager Long Yu worked out. And this deal became known as the Articles of Favorable Treatment, and they were finalized in February 1912. Concerning eunuchs, the verdict was, quote, The services of all the persons of various grades hitherto employed in the palace may be retained, but in future no eunuchs are to be added to the staff, end quote. So for those remaining 900 or so eunuchs who remained with the little court, as the much-reduced royal family was referred to, they got a reprieve. So for a dozen years, from the age of 4 to 16, Pu Yi got to remain in the palace. And the stories of his mistreatment of the eunuchs and his employ became part and parcel of the Pu Yi legend. Even as a child, he was cruel and downright sadistic. He notoriously manhandled and abused his eunuchs. And the older he got, the more he beat them. For his own reasons, perhaps because of the way his eunuchs controlled him and got in his way of doing whatever he wanted to do, he grew to dislike them intensely. And these feelings reached their crescendo on July 16, 1923, when, without any notice whatsoever, he called all 1,137 palace eunuchs to the Qianqingmen Gate and announced to them that henceforth their services were no longer required and they were hereby expelled. Now, in the Bertolucci film, The Last Emperor, you may recall a scene where, having been caught stealing treasures from the palace and selling them around town, certain eunuchs caused a fire in the palace to cover their tracks. And this incensed Puyi to no end, and he got so angry, he decided to get rid of them. Now, besides his mistrust and revulsion... The cost to maintaining so many eunuchs was starting to get prohibitive. So all but 175 of them had to leave. And on the way out of the gates of the palace, on a rainy day, the ground, one big muddy mess, they were patted down and searched for stolen objects or anything of value that they might have lifted from the palace in order to get something of a start in their new life. Everything was taken back and they were unceremoniously booted out, filled with hatred and bitterness. Many of them cursed Puyi and the imperial family, saying the most foul words on the way out the door. For many of these eunuchs, they ended up living rough on the streets of Beijing, and in their homelessness became somewhat of an eyesore. No one would hire them or offer to help, aside from the fact that most of them were illiterate and uneducated, Society had always viewed them as freaks and abominations, and now they were on their own, living amongst these people who so despised them, like a dog without a bone, an actor out alone. They made a living through begging or engaging in petty crime. They were often taunted on the streets, objects of derision. Some killed themselves, no doubt. It was a horrible end, paying the high price for all the crimes and atrocities of these notorious eunuchs of dynasties past who we covered in these past episodes. The following year, in 1924, it was finally over. And this time for real. No reprieves for anyone this time. If you recall from the Warlord History series, the Christian general, Feng Yuxiang, and he launched his Beijing coup on October 24, 1924. This coup toppled the Jirli clique from power, namely Cao Kun and Wu Pei Fu. And to help grease the wheels and persuade Feng to move against the Jirli clique, the Japanese in Manchuria gave Feng a big chunk of change and made a lot of promises. And when it was all over, the now rebranded Guomindun army of Feng Yuxiang, along with his ally, and I have ally in quotation marks, Zhang Zolin, well, they were left in control of the north. 
And you recall, the south of China, ever since the Wuchang Uprising on 10-10-1911, was controlled by Sun Yat-sen's KMT government that was in the south of China, and they ruled that from their Guangzhou base. And one of the upshots to all of this was that Feng Yuxiang, never a fan of the Qing or the imperial family, with only an hour or so's notice, booted Puyi, his family, and all remaining eunuchs out of the Forbidden City. And the way they did this was to hand Puyi a formal notice on November 5th, 1924, and in this document, known as the Revision to the Articles of Favorable Treatment, well, they basically pulled the remainder of whatever rug was left that the royal family was still standing on. They all had to vacate the Forbidden City. Puyi couldn't call himself emperor anymore and was not allowed to employ eunuchs. So they all got kicked out. Not just the remaining eunuchs, but about a hundred palace maids. They too had to go out into this world they knew almost nothing about. And we'll see in a moment, even though he was prohibited to employ eunuchs, pretty much up until the end came for him in 1945, during the Tianjin and Changchun periods of Puyi's life, he continued to have a small retinue of eunuchs around him and his family. And let me add, the physical and verbal abuse he continued to heap on the eunuchs and his employ was well documented. And when 1945 came, part of the blowback from his bad idea to get talked into becoming emperor of Manchukuo by the Japanese was that, once and for all, the institution of eunuchs concluded. The final ten or so who cared for him and his opium-addicted empress, Wan Rong, got their pink slips, and both of their once royal lives descended into hell. The 1911 revolution, then the 1923 expulsion from the palace by Pu Yi, then Feng Yuxiang unceremoniously kicking them out in 1924, and finally, for those dozen or more who stuck with the royal family throughout the remainder of the 1920s and 30s, clear through the puppet state of Manchukuo till the end of World War II. Eunuchs, going back to the Shang dynasty, have been a part of Chinese history for more than 3,000 years. That's a lot of eunuchs. Throughout this series, I think I mentioned only a dozen or so, and these wicked and corrupt souls did more than just bring down a few dynasties. In popular Chinese history, they became the ugly face of the countless hundreds of thousands of ordinary palace eunuchs who served loyally and without incident, going back to the Shang kings. All of them had their rather ordinary lives painted with the same brush as these villains I've introduced these past episodes. So before we close up shop, let me mention Sun Yao Ting. Just as Puyi is forevermore known as the last emperor, Sun Yao Ting is equally known as the last eunuch. He passed away a quarter century ago in 1996. Chinese historian and author Jia Yinghua gave Sun a final victory lap in his book, The Last Eunuch, The Life of Sun Yao Ting. That was published in March of 2009. There was also a 1987 Chinese biopic called Zhongguo Zuihou Yiga Taijian, The Last Eunuch of China, that told the story of a eunuch called Liu Lai Shi, and it was based on a novel written by the great Hong Kong American novelist Ni Kuang, who used Sun Yao Ting as his inspiration for the book. Sun was an ethnic Manchu, born near Tianjin, and at eight years of age, was castrated by his father. This was in 1911 or 1912, which means this young boy aspired to be a eunuch just as the institution was on its way to the dustbin of history. It had taken a couple months for young Sun Yao Ting to recover from his castration, but recover he did just in time for Pu Yi's abdication. But as I said, it wasn't until 1924 that the eunuchs and their royal masters all got kicked out of the Forbidden City. So despite joining the ranks of eunuchs at a bad time, he still got to serve in the palace for eight years, entering service in 1916, just 14 years old. His first employer was Puyi's uncle, Zai Tao. 
A lot of eunuchs served members of the Manchu royal family and other high-ranking aristocrats who didn't live inside the palace walls. And many of these eunuchs, even after 1924, continued to serve them. But Sun Yao-ting was mainly in the service of the Empress Wanrong, wife and Empress consort to Puyi. We discussed her tragic and dismal life in that Kawashima Yoshiko series. She had a very sad and horrible ending, this last empress of China. And the last eunuch of China, Sun Yao-ting, he served her. And because of the nature of his position, he was in regular contact with Puyi as well. And Sun Yao-ting vividly recounted the last emperor's vile mistreatment of his eunuchs and how he derived so much pleasure from making them miserable. When the Manchukuo period of Puyi's life commenced in 1932, Sun Yao-ting later left Beijing to join the royal couple in Changchun, the capital. Before the bitter end came, Sun Yao-ting had already returned to Beijing, stressing out that he himself might suffer a collaborator's fate due to his service to the emperor and empress of Manchukuo. Like so many others who came before him, he too ended up joining one of those eunuch retirement homes invariably located in a Buddhist temple. And it was later on at Guanghua Temple that Sun lived out his last days. There were two times in his life where Sun Yao-ting recalled crying. First time was after his castration. The second time was during the Cultural Revolution, when his family, mindful of the consequences if found, disposed of his precious Baal, those severed parts of his body that tradition insisted he had to be buried with when his time came. During the Cultural Revolution, Sun Yao-ting had been sent back to his village outside Tianjin, and all surviving eunuchs during those terrible Cultural Revolution years from the mid-60s to the mid-70s had to put up with quite a bit of abuse from Red Guards and other enthusiastic participants. Historian and author Jia Yinghua met Sun around the end of the Cultural Revolution, and over a period of 20 years, slowly coaxed his story out. And Sun actually ended up faring a lot better than many of his fellow eunuchs. In his 80s and 90s, Sun Yao-ting became sort of a, a living legend in China, the last living imperial eunuch from a distant age. He became a kind of living history, and having resided at the Forbidden City for so many years like he did, he knew the place inside out, and anything in the palace viewed by the hundreds of thousands of tourists who came to see it, well, he made sure the curators and experts were accurate in what they displayed. So he died on December 17, 1996, just shy of his 94th birthday. Sun Yao-ting, he was the last. You know, If you ever find yourself in Beijing, you can take the subway line one all the way to its eastern terminus at Pinghua Yuan, and from there you can walk to the Eunuch Museum. It's located inside the Tianyi Tomb Complex. Tianyi, unlike all these other rogues I've been mentioning going back to part one, he was one of the good eunuchs, the ones we don't hear about as much. He served three emperors over the period of 63 years during the Ming Dynasty, Jia Jing, Long Qing, and Wan Li. And he was known as the Wan Li Emperor's favorite. No drama with this eunuch, so maybe that's why we don't remember him as much. He was a good eunuch. That is to say, he didn't side with any factions or use his influential position to play politics or put his thumb on the scale to cause events to happen one way or another. He was impartial at court. And most of all, he was loyal to the emperor. And in the case of the Wanli emperor, he served him so well that when Tianyi died in 1605, Wanli called for a very fine tomb to be built for this favorite of his. And there, Tianyi was laid to rest, with other eunuchs joining him in that complex. Wan Li not only called for three days of official mourning when he died, but had him interred in a small replica of the kind of mausoleum that only an emperor might have. During the Republican period, 1912 to 1949, the tomb was 
plundered by soldiers or bandits. I'm not sure if the place got another ransacking during the Cultural Revolution, but it wouldn't be surprising if it did. Anyway, it's called the Tianyi Eunuch Museum. I haven't seen it, but I have it on my to-do list next time I'm somewhere out in western Beijing. And that, my fine friends and respected and downright venerated CHP listeners, is going to bring things to a close, for this series anyway. Class dismissed a little earlier than usual today. Hope you don't mind. And I hope you won't hold me in too much contempt if I bend your ear one more time about how you can support me and my humble efforts to put all this free content out there for millions and millions of podcast listeners around the world. There are two ways. You can go to patreon.com slash China History Podcast, and for less than the price of a chalupa at Taco Bell, you could keep this marble boat afloat for just a little bit longer. Another way to donate to this noble cause is to head on over to paypal.me slash China History Podcast, and I assure you, I'll be equally as thankful. So, that's it for this series, introducing eunuchs in Chinese history. I hope you enjoyed it. This here's Lazel Montgomery signing off from Shaky Town here in the State of Confusion. Please do consider coming back in two weeks' time for what's already shaping up to be another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.